Good morning, everybody. This is the California Apprenticeship Initiative uh, November webinar. Uh, I just want to make sure, are people hearing me? Oh, good, good. So uh, welcome, everybody. I, my name is Caleb Van Docto. I'm with Social Policy Research Associates and part of your technical assistance team uh, here in, uh, in Oakland, California, coming to you. And I'm so pleased this morning because we have on the line uh, Alexandra Wright from the uh, Ventura County Community College uh, District. Um, she is the director of the... Uh, uh, community College uh, Economic and Workforce Development. And uh, I'm particularly pleased when she uh, agreed to uh, uh, chat with us today for this webinar because uh, she and I have had, has ha have had a couple of great conversations about some of the work that um, she did um, actually I think even before the, uh, the uh, CAI grant came to Ventura um, when she was just mapping out some of the regional economic circumstances of the county and um, using that information to not only help drive some of the decisions that were ultimately made in the county, but also to be able to communicate, especially with county officials and stakeholders in the area. Um, and so, so pleased. She also uh, presented at Meeting of the Minds this year and, uh, and had a great presentation. And I, you know, so I'm really glad that she also agreed to share with us uh, some of her work and some of the activities that are going on in Ventura this year as well. I think it'll be um, something that's particularly helpful for uh, uh, the CAI grantees and informative for other people that are looking to really help scale their return on investment in their regions, connect and get stakeholders on board with what they're trying to do um, around areas of apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship, et cetera. Um, so a little bit of um, just logistical managing um, uh, ahead of time. I think everybody is familiar with and has access to uh, their, ability, their chat box on the Zoom platform, but you should have either above or below your screen by holding your cursor over the screen. You should be able to bring up a chat, bo chat box by clicking a box that says chat. And we may have questions and opportunities for you to either respond to questions or ask questions your own. And one of the easy ways you can do that is through the chat box. And uh, I or somebody on my team here at SPR will make sure to um, get those questions out to Alexandra as we chat today. So with that, let me turn it over to Alexandra. Um, welcome, thank you for being here and um, take it away. Great, thank you, Caleb. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what we're gonna go over today is basically um, the methodology that I've developed over the past decade um, in working with community colleges <clears throat> to help identify and strategically plan for investment for career education and apprenticeships. Um, we have a small group of participants, so please feel free to stick a note in the chat box. We can make this very contextualized to your region, um, and we can go from there. <clears throat> so, to start with, I wanted to give you guys an idea of where to look for information to begin with. Okay, sorry, there we go. There we go. So I like to lay out an idea of where to get information. So for most of us in the state of California, we are accustomed to our centers of excellences. Um, when it comes to labor market information, there are two types. There's traditional and real time. Market information are your static data and statistics, typically derived from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, quarterly census on employment and wages. That's what um, the EMSI database that the Center of Excellence is used, that's how they derive their information. They also derive demographic information from U.S. Census and American Community Survey. Um, the other type of labor market information is real time. So real-time information are more like your job postings. Um, what's going on currently in terms of job postings, the quantity of them, what skills are being posted. So you can think of it as traditional LMI being more like a balance sheet. It's a static view of what is happening at a single point in time versus real-time market and labor market information, which is more like your profit and loss statement, right? It's looking at changes over time. 
Um, so when you go in to do your analysis, so say you're just beginning or you've kind of identified some top in industry sectors, you know, that's the one thing about regional economics. Um, it's a social science, right? So it's partially intuitive. We can look around our communities. We can see um, where the hot spots are in terms of industry sectors. Um, what digging deeper into that data does for you is it allows you to very explicitly identify areas of high impact occupations. Um, and we can go into defining high impact a little later in this, in this webinar. So you're going to have quantitative data and you're going to have qualitative analysis. And you have to combine those two in order to get an accurate perspective of what's going on in your community. So for your quantitative data, we have our centers of excellences, which uh, we all probably went to for our, our grants, our California Apprenticeship Initiative grants. Uh, but you also have several other um, avenues to garner this information. You have a workforce development board in every one of our communities. They typically have a plan. It is required by federal law. And that plan requires a deep dive into the economics of the region. So if you were to Google your workforce development board in your local area and their regional plan or their local plan, those are the two words you need, um, it's going to pop up something and I guarantee you you're going to have some statistics in there. You're going to have some sort of identification of where their priorities are. It's also really good to, um, to reconcile what community colleges are doing and their priorities with the Workforce Development Board, uh, particularly in light of Perkins 5 coming out. Um, it, there really is an effort on the part of the federal government and the state government to unify uh, via common metrics, both Department of Labor and Department of Education programs. The Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014 is a perfect example of that, where we saw Title II adult education programs run by Department of Education integrated into Department of Labor, Title I, Title III, and Title IV programs, which are your adult and dislocated workers and your, your vocational rehab um, and wagner Pizer Act stuff. So again, um, we're seeing more and more so those common metrics between Workforce Development Board, which are primarily focused on Department of Labor. The apprenticeship initiative itself Apprenticeships are run at a U.S. Department of Labor, so again, it's particularly important for us at community colleges to make sure that we're reconciling our priority sectors with our Workforce Development Board. You also are going to have a county general plan in every area. Uh, our in Ventura, we happen to be going through an update, so it was very convenient for us. County general plans have a myriad of background data. They are required to look at industry sectors and occupations. So that's another avenue for you. Um, California EDD, of course, um, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, if your college happens to have an economic and workforce development division, typically collecting some sort of information, their information will likely be a little more qualitative in scope and nature. Um, and then of course you have your EMSI database. I can't speak highly enough of them. I've been working with um, economic modeling for over a decade now and their approach to, um, to providing us the different reports that they do to being able to query. Um, I use both the regular database and I use job analytics. Some of us out there might be using, um, uh, I think it's called Career Coach, uh, which is another kind of interactive database for work-based learning opportunities. Um, so that's always an option for you too. Now you want to match that quantitative data with qualitative analysis, right? Because your quantitative data, as we go through this, it's just going to tell you again that static data, okay? You have growth in production occupations. You have growth in food and accommodation. But it's not going to tell you the competencies or the learning objectives that you need to correlate with <clears throat> your education and training programs. So that's where you want to get to your county economic development organizations, you want to get to industry directly, quite honestly. Um, that's the last one I have on there, individual narrative inquiry with industry. I personally use a structured focused approach. Um, I'm using the same questions when I talk to industry, though I will vary depending on their answers to dig a little deeper. Again, what I'm looking for are um, high impact occupations from, from industry sectors that are high demand um, even if they're, they're entry-level occupations with a little lower wages than we like to see, they are stepping stones, right, into higher-level occupations that, uh, that are 
likely apprenticeable. Um, and so I, I do that inquiry to further identify those competencies, the equipment needs that are necessary, um, and again, the learning objectives. And then I, I am able to, uh, to pass that on to faculty um, to assist them with the development of their programs. Uh, you can also go to your municipal economic development directors. Uh, every single city has an economic development director and they know a lot. They're the ones that are out there knocking on doors. Um, so to be able to connect with them, sit down with them for about an hour, let them know who you are, you're from the community college, you're looking at, at um, identifying uh, areas for strategic investment in career education and apprenticeships, um, I'm sure they would be happy to talk with you. Workforce development is something that economic development departments haven't necessarily specialized in. Prior to 2008, uh, really your, your top priority for economic development was infrastructure. Uh, 2008 changed the world and really it's labor needs now. Um, with the advancement of technology and globalization, uh, Labor is really, outside of things like broadband, labor is really where the majority of these municipalities are focusing on in order to make themselves competitive for business attraction and being able to retain and expand their existing businesses. Um, of course, you have your team of commerce. Commerce typically have an economic development or a workforce development committee. Again, another good good gathering of folk. Um, I try to, to take advantage of existing industry gatherings to do research so that we are not A, inundating our community with more meetings and gatherings, and B, we're really just leveraging resources with other entities and organizations that are already kind of doing this work, not necessarily in workforce development, but doing something with industry. So your chambers of commerce and your workforce development board sector committees those are really good opportunities to get on the agenda and have a series of questions that you want to ask. Again, you have a, a set forum already prepared for you, so take advantage of it. Um, is, uh, are there any questions? I see one question up here right now, Never Done Query Tool Protocol. Um, sure, so when I go and I question industry, um, I'm asking them, First and foremost, what are your most difficult positions to fill at entry, middle, and high level skills? Now, keeping in mind we're a community college, so our focus really needs to be on those entry and middle skills. And academically, our focus could be on transfer um, for those higher skills. But that's not really, um, I'd say, an immediate need for us who are managing apprenticeship programs. We really want to know about those entry and middle skill jobs. So once we identify those occupations, then you can start to dig a little deeper. What I typically ask them are, okay, so what are the daily um, activities of that occupation and what are the skill sets, both technical and soft skills that are needed for that occupation? Um, I typically walk in uh, Somewhat prepared, uh, if you use Bureau of Labor Statistics ONET to look up occupations, it's actually a wealth of information and they give you a full listing of detailed work activities and tasks along with technical soft skills and they actually have a military crosswalk that's very interesting. So I really encourage you guys to, to look at ONET once you started to identify occupations because that'll give you a nice background when you're talking to employers. Um, so once we identify the skills, then I start to ask them, um, you know, what are their daily activities and what are the skills that they can build over time, right? Because we're talking, we're speaking about the context of apprenticeships. So what we want to do is, is be able to uh, have somebody prepared. I do both pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships, right? So for pre-apprenticeships, my inquiry includes, I do a lot of regression analysis, which is simply a fancy term for saying, all right, employers, what are the skills that you need for these entry-level occupations across different subsectors? I'll use manufacturing as a good example. We have about seven subsectors here in Ventura, ranging from food production to aerospace to custom um, steel design to biomedical manufacturing and pharmaceutical. 
Um, so I'll take all of those entry level positions, for example, assemblers that exist across all areas from makeup manufacturing to food production, and I'll find the generalizable qualities and that's what goes into a short term pre apprenticeship training. I also combine my pre-apprenticeship training with adult education. So there's literacy and mathematics and work readiness and civics built into the technical training. Um, and then for the actual apprenticeable occupations, again, I'm looking for, so at what point in time or how quickly does an employee need to learn the skills as they move up this ladder, right? My approach to apprenticeships, I actually use quality credit bearing classes that are in existence already. And so I'm working with faculty to ensure that we're addressing all those competencies and learning objectives. And then those students are simply registering for one class a semester. Um, so I hope that gives you a little more um, detail about what I was speaking of. And we can go into it a little further um, if you'd like. All right, we're going to go to the next screen. Oops, there we go. All right, so when we look at quantitative data, we have a handful of variables that we want to start with. First and foremost, we want to look at industry sectors by quantity of jobs. It's really important that we don't ignore industry sectors or forsake them in our investigation of occupations. Understanding how our industry sectors are moving in our region is really, it's quintessential if you're going to identify, like I've said before, high impact occupations. High impact are those occupations that are providing a high degree of multiplier effect in your local community. Um, again, I'm going to go into that a little later when we get to another screen. So um, quantity of jobs. I'm giving you Ventura County here, just as an example. You're going to see government at the top of the list in every analysis because that's simply the way it rolls. I used to be, as an economist, I used to be able to, uh, or I used to think, oh, government is public sector, it's not private dollars helping the economy churn. As I have evolved in my, in my knowledge and age, I've now recognized that actually government is a very pertinent sector in our economies. And they are a sector that can easily participate in apprenticeships, uh, be it county utilities and facilities programs, diesel tech programs, to accounting and managerial programs. So don't ignore your government sectors. Um, and I guarantee you, your county government would probably be fairly pleased if they were to receive some assistance from the community college because they are just like the private sector. They have issues filling these positions. Um, so then you're going to see retail um, here in Ventura County. Our primary sectors are um, retail, food and accommodation. You have your healthcare, you have your manufacturing, and you have your ag. And then you move into professional, scientific, and technical services. Those are your architects, your engineers, your independent consultants in that case. Um, administrative support and waste management. I've often wondered why they, the federal government puts these two together, but they do. <laughs> um, professional admin is a huge, huge demand in our county. I would suspect that you would see that mirrored in your, your local counties as well. So the next one that we want to look at is by wage. So again, we want to, although we want to focus on livable wage jobs, there is something to be said for taking the non-traditional student out of Mickey D's, right, and getting them an entry-level position that may not be livable wage right at that point, but at least it's a pathway, right? It's a career and college pathway that's getting them a stepping stone. So uh, typically you do see utilities at the top of this, management of companies. I'm seeing this everywhere. I would really pay attention to management across all industry sectors. I think community colleges could have a real, um, a real meaningful contribution to management studies where in the past we have left that to universities, third and fourth year university students. There's no reason why we can't start with things like operations management for manufacturing companies at the community college level. So once you look at total um, industry sectors by quantity of jobs and by wage, we want to now go to exports. So here's where I'm going to detail the high impact. Um, when you look at exports in an area, as you can see this screen, 
Manufacturing is about 14.6 billion in exports here in Ventura County, followed by ag is the next highest at 2.8. Now these are 2017 exports. And so I can tell you that in 2016, between 2016 and 2017, we saw a $300 million growth in manufacturing exports and a $400 million growth in ag. What does that tell me? That tells me that those sectors are pulling in money from the outside, right? So when you pull in money from the outside, those, those dollars are coming into your local community and they're churning through that local community via wages, supply chain purchases, and purchases of household goods. It's also coming into your community in the form of taxes. Those are the dollars that pay for, for local improvements like roads and libraries and parks and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really important for us to pay attention to top export sectors because, again, that's how you start to delineate where a high impact occupation is versus a low impact occupation. Um, so I hope that makes sense to everybody uh, and we'll keep going from there. Uh, exports are really big for urban areas. Uh, I have, um, I have uh, a quick note, where do you find export data? You can actually get the export data through EMSI. Uh, you can also get it through your county general plans and your, um, your economic development organization typically, typically have a good list of your exports. If you want to do the research yourself, um, export data is available through um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, but economic EMSI, if you guys have that database, you can access it through their input output model. You got to go into their input output model and then there's a particular report that's called exports and you can pull it from there. Um, so please let me know uh, if you need anything else regarding that. Um, all right, regional exports, we're gonna go on to the next one. So uh, exports are big for urban areas. However, if you are in a, in a rural area, I spent a lot of time in rural areas. I have an affinity for rural areas. It's a much more complex issue to, to build economic vitality in a rural area. Um, one of their biggest strategies are import replacement, right? So in urban areas, you want to expand your exports, right? And pull those dollars in. FYI, um, hospitality, hotel and restaurant management, that is technically an export, right? Unfortunately, in our databases, we cannot decipher hospitality from food and accommodation. Um, it's kind of all wrapped up together, so we don't necessarily know how many people are coming in for tourism. You could also, uh, one of your resources could be a local tourism board if you have one. Um, to kind of figure out what the propensity is, but hospitality is a really good export industry. Um, but back to imports, uh, imports for rural areas, replacement of imports is really um, a top, uh, top pathway, I would say, to building rural economies in this, uh, rural economies that um, don't have the opportunity to build exports, right? So basically in a rural area, uh, for example, you know, you're not going to get a 250 member warehouse to move to a rural area, right? Um, so what are your options? Your options really are to build small business and to replace those imports. One of the ways that you can start to identify the imports is by running a supply chain logistics. Again, economic modeling has this EMSI, but you can also get this from other sources. All right. Next piece that I go to, so we have industry sectors largest by quantity, then we looked at the wages, then we started looking at exports and imports, now we want to look at growth over time. A lot of the reports that you see out of COE, as well as, as other entities, will give you projections. Um, I personally do not use projections. Um, projections are simply an algorithm of past productivity. So because 2008 changed the world, looking at a 20 year projection that has an algorithm that goes 20 years back, it's going to be, it's going to be inaccurate, right? Because things change. So I prefer to look to do that qualitative and quantitative inquiry to kind of see where things are going. 
it's not going to hurt you to look at projections, but just take it with a grain of salt, right? Um, so what I did here is I often take about five to six years at a time, and I looked at fastest growing industry sectors, right? So you see here, uh, 2012 to 2018, I put percent change and quantity change along with earnings per worker. Um, you're gonna see this, so this is again Ventura County. Um, we have a large amount of growth in, of course, our food services and drinking establishments, local government grew there. Um, ambulatory health services, that as well as nursing and residential care facilities, you're, you're probably gonna see reflected in your communities as well, assisted living facilities. Uh, caregiving is one of our pre-apprenticeship programs that leads into hopefully an apprenticeship in MA, um, medical assisting, um, as well as other opportunities, including just going to school to be full-time nurse. Um, you'll see food and beverage stores there, educational services, you know, as population grows. So when we look at, at our industry sectors as well, if you're exports, another real good clue is to look at, so, at service-based sectors, right? So food and accommodation and are always gonna be growing because like I said, you have the combination of local needs as well as tourism needs. But healthcare, particularly in residential care, assisted living facility and nursing, and then educational services, those are two sectors that are based on population growth. So as long as you still see population growth in your region, those are two real good bets. I'm a big proponent of teacher prep we're working on that ourselves here. I'm doing some investigation into actual teacher apprenticeships. Um, so I'd be happy to share that over time um, as, as we find out new things. Uh, but always pay attention again to those service oriented uh, sectors. Uh, then you're going to go down, you're going to see uh, constructions of buildings. So construction's coming back. You're going to see building materials and gardening equipment. Uh, so fabricated metal product manufacturing there towards the bottom. Um, Although it's not at the top of the list, it's within the first top, what, 10 or so. Um, manufacturing, I will stop for pause for a moment. Manufacturing, although we have seen a lot of it go overseas, it is alive and well in the United States, particularly in the area of custom manufacturing. Um, we had the news yesterday of GM closing their plants, moving a lot of production overseas. Again, you know, automation and globalization are trending um, for large manufacturers to go that route because they want to keep a particular profit margin and they're not really concerned necessarily about the regional economy. And that's, you know, that's a whole nother, another webinar, right? But in terms of custom manufacturing in the United States, it is alive and well. Those small manufacturing companies, 50, 30, even five employees, um, I'm working with um, a, a guy right now in Ventura who literally has two employees and an intern, and he's got about three Department of Defense contracts, you know, so really pay attention to your, your fabricated metal product manufacturing. That's your aerospace stuff um, and your Department of Defense stuff. All right, uh, so fastest growing industry sectors, again, it's gonna help you strategically prioritize what the needs are in your local community. And so that's why we're looking at this graph. All right, next slide, fastest growing occupations. So you see kind of what I laid down there, laid over. I did fastest growing industries combined with fastest growing occupations. Now you see a reflection here, right? You see food and prep at the top. You see education training um, there at the top as well. Personal care service, those are the caregivers I was talking about from those residential facilities on the previous slide. Construction and, and extraction, um, healthcare practitioners, sales and related occupations, healthcare support there. Um, you're all, you know what I've seen a lot in the past handful of years, your building and grounds cleaning and maintenance occupations. Um, installation maintenance and repair as well. So those are things to pay attention to. We're working on industrial machine mechanic apprenticeships right now. Uh, so you can see the reflection of the in-demand occupations um, with uh, ag or against the industry sector growth. And that's what you wanna, you know, that's your sense of validity, right? Um, you want to wait, make sure those things are matching. Your narrative inquiry, that's going to be a third type of validity, right? Your contextual validity. Um, but right now, when uh, we're looking at the actual data for industry versus occupations, just want to make sure that they're lining up, right? And that we're prioritizing the correct industry sectors. All right, I'm going to stop for just a second um, and read the chat just in case there's a question. 
um, teacher apprenticeships, uh, target participant of professional training to teach new teacher bowls, something else. Yeah, so what I was speaking of is apprenticeships for new teachers, right? So I define apprenticeships as we all do. Um, I, I basically tell people they're full-time employment with a set educational path, right? And so teacher prep often has a lot of practicum included in it where they're not quite ready to get out there, but they're learning in the classroom. So that's something separate, right? And that goes for healthcare professions as well. But basically, if we could develop, um, I, like I said, I'm in the middle of the investigation of it, um, an apprenticeship that will permit a teacher to start, and maybe it's not in an actual teaching position. Maybe it's as... I don't know, a front desk office person in a school. Maybe it's, you know, it's a, um, a substitute teacher or I, I, I don't know. It, it, maybe it's some other occupation within the administration of a school district so that while they're going through school, they're still going to class and they're getting that teacher prep. Um, so again, I, I apologize. I, I don't have more details for you, but like I said, we're investigating it and we'll let you know when we find out. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on now. You saw the reflection of the fastest growing occupations over the same amount of time. Remember, we wanna be, we wanna be focused and structured um, with whatever we're doing so our comparisons are equivalent. So I looked at the same amount of time for the occupations as I did for the industry sectors. Okay. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this is something that I've been doing in Ventura County. We happen to be a multi-college district. So we have three community colleges in our district, yet we have a single regional economy. Our workforce development board is considered a single local and regional area. We're very fortunate for that. It's just bound by county borders. We also have our own MSA. So we're just, we're very fortunate. We're not sharing across county lines. Um, when you do, just for those of you who are sharing, um, regions across county lines. Um, I was just looking at this. When you look at the data, I, I was looking at this actually in terms of adult education and the three-year planning process that's going on right now. Um, when you're looking at those bordering borderline communities in your counties, one of the things that you might want to look at are, again, um, you can run by zip code industry sectors and occupations using EMSI. You can request that information from your center of excellence. Um, but you just want to be careful that you're not, you know, our community colleges are funded via property taxes, right? Um, here in Ventura County, we happen to be a large district, so it really, it actually is our local property taxes that are funding us. I've always been very cognizant um, working in other states at community colleges to create or to, to ensure that the return on investment are for the local, local taxpayers, right? So if you're, if you're, on a border, bordering county, you don't want to dive into that entire county's industry sectors, but you want to look at those zip codes that are sitting next to your county border and identify maybe, you know, just a top handful of complementary um, occupations that you could perhaps uh, kill multiple birds with the same stone, right? You don't want to create an entire program to serve a separate county than the one your community college is in, but you certainly can leverage educational programs if that makes sense. Um, okay, so this screen that you see right up here, the reason why I looked at this is because I wanted to know the service area, right? So I know where my industry sectors are. The majority of our base industry sectors are located in Oxnard and Ventura County. By base industry sectors, I mean export industry sectors. Um, Non-base are, again, non-export industry sectors. Those are your service sectors that are serving your, your daily needs um, uh, uh, in the community, right? Those, the, the household services that we need every day. Um, and so what I did here is I actually wanted to look at career education students. I wanted to see where they were coming from um, because even, you, you know, you can look at your college enrollment, but that's not really going to give you an accurate picture of where the demand is coming from. You know, particularly keeping in mind the development of apprenticeship programs, you know, again, we have colleges that go Oxnard, Moore Park, and Ventura. If we're developing a program that has to do with, say, industrial machine mechanics, well, we want to produce that program in, in the area that the need is, 
right? So we wouldn't want to design that program up at Moore Park. We'd want to design it over at Oxnard. However, if we were designing an apprenticeship program for, say, cybersecurity network um, technicians, that program we may want at Moore Park because Conejo Valley is highly concentrated with professional, technical, and scientific occupations. So again, looking at where your student body is coming from and where those residents are coming from, um, I think is kind of helpful. It can really, again, help with the strategic decision making so that you can, again, get to that point where you're scaling all of these efforts, right? You're not making the decisions in a vacuum anymore. Um, one of the interesting things, if you notice on this map, over 26% of our enrollment in career education is coming from Oxnard. Yet Oxnard is one of our smallest community colleges. So that's going to assist us in other types of decision making when it comes to funding allocations, right, and students of need. So we have our new um, funding formulas coming down from the state where we're no longer going by FTES. That's what 60% of our funding formula now. The other 40% is made up of need. So your financial aid percentage along with um, success after completion. Those are about seven metrics that have to do with, um, with student placement after completion. Uh, so again, this all kind of wraps in together. We're really at a tipping point in terms of strategic planning for community colleges because you can see how you know, we're just talking about this apprenticeship initiative, but it really bleeds across all areas of development for your community colleges. All right, we're going to go to the next one. All right, so now, whoops, um, sorry, real-time labor market data. <clears throat> so this is your job posting. So I just pulled a sample for you guys of what a real-time LMI looks like. Um, I took postings over a five-year period. You can see there January 2012 through December 2017. Um, again, these, this came from EMSI. What they are doing is querying all online job postings. So they're looking at Indeed.com. They're looking at Jobs.com. They're looking at LinkedIn. They're looking at all of these different online job postings and they're deduplicating it, right? Because sometimes you can find the same jobs on multiple sites. So they're deduplicating it and then they're posting it up here so you can run it. So you can see up here, um, I chose this because it's got a nice uh, span of diversity, right? You can see it goes from production op occupations um, right into office administrative support, into you know, nursing and home health aides. Um, you know, you have your mathematical science occupations, that's a lot of data and statistics nowadays, um, education and training, animal care and service workers. Um, so what this is telling me is, all right, so I know my top industry sectors in Ventura, okay? I know it's manufacturing, ag, healthcare, hospitality, um, and, and moving from there, and education, I'll throw education in there as well. Um, going from there, I looked at my occupations. All right, my fastest growing occupations were reflected, particularly for my entry level occupations, entry level and middle skill occupations that are completely apprenticeable. Um, and now I went to go look at my job postings um, because that's going to tell me what the high, high need is. So as you look down this list, you can see um, that's what's this is a good one. Okay. Other office and administrative support workers, there were 68 month average monthly postings throughout January 2012 to December 2017, but there were actually an average of 508 hires, okay? Um, you can see that also at the top occupation, production occupations, 86 postings, 454 hires. That's the kind of stuff that we want to pay attention to, right? Again, our goal is to get people is to accommodate the worker of the 21st century, right? We have a new workforce paradigm that's been brought forth by this era. Um, that paradigm is really a dualistic system. That system is on the one hand, our, our economy, our economy is demanding workers that are interdisciplinary, critically thinking and entrepreneurial. On the other hand, we have workers that are demanding new educational platforms that accommodate full-time employment, right? We can no longer provide classroom training from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's just not going to work. Um, so again, this, is, this job postings data is telling us, all right, other production occupations, um, office and administrative support workers. Let's see if there's any IT in here. I don't see any IT. IT 
and, and computer science usually don't pop up on this, but we can talk about that in a moment if you're interested. Um, what this is actually showing us is where the propensity for hire is. So these are stepping stone occupations. I approach pre-apprenticeships. Um, I differentiate it from traditional academia in community colleges to show faculty we are not competing to garner the same students. We are actually attracting new and different students that would have never come to the community college. So I call those non-traditional or modern students. Um, and what we're looking to do is get them, these are below post-secondary students in a lot of circumstances. So like I said, our pre-apprenticeships are in assembly technician for manufacturing, caregiving, and residential building. We're looking at starting some in um, professional admin next semester, and we're looking at agriculture as well. Um, but those are your stepping stone occupations that get people trained, get them to secondary level. We place them all in jobs, so I tie it really tightly to the unions um, and to employers so that these pre-apprenticeships or awards of completion are recognizable by the human resources at all these areas. Um, the faculty go out a lot too, um, the instructors go out and talk to industry sectors, um, and so it helps that person now, the goal is that they get placed in a job in their field and that they continue their education. And hopefully they continue their education in an apprenticeship model. So that's kind of what this screen is showing you is, okay, let's, we know our top industry sectors, we saw our top occupations. This is further validating production workers, it's validating home health aides, it's validating assemblers and fa uh, fabricators. But look at what else though, it's actually showing me um, that there's some other stuff. Let's see what's going on here. Um, installation, maintenance, and repair. Sorry, post-secondary teachers, 102 hires. Um, it's actually helping me, education, training, and library services, 145 hires. It's actually showing me, too, that there are a couple other occupations out there that may not have fallen under those fastest-growing occupations, but they're high-demand occupations. So that's the difference. All right, I'm going to keep going here. All right, so um, going through this data, what does this data do for us, right? Um, it provides us with an analytical framework that when combined with our narrative inquiry and our informational interviews, our qualitative study, we can now identify those high demand and emerging occupations. We also can identify the high impact occupations, right? The stuff that's going to make our local economic engine churn. And that's the stuff that really makes an impression on our community, right? Because we're here to serve, we're, we're public organizations that are here to serve our larger community. And yes, our, our, our client is the student. Um, However, if we broaden that discussion, we can say our purpose is to participate in building a vibrant and competitive economy and also provide opportunity to every community member in our area, not just the traditional student who's going to graduate from high school and go to community colleges full time, but that non-traditional modern student, right? We are, we as community colleges in this era are inextricably linked to opportunity, to economic opportunity. And although we will always pride ourselves on, on being a pathway to individual enlightenment and that academic prowess, we cannot neglect the fact that we are tied to economic opportunity and our community members are depending on us. So that's what this analytical framework kind of does. Um, it also provides a proactive accountability, right? So now we're really looking at our investment of be it strong workforce dollars or apprenticeship initiative dollars or Perkins dollars, whatever it is, to tell us, hey, this is where we should be going with this. Now, that's not to say that, you know, other programs that maybe aren't popping up on the fastest growing aren't of relevance. It's just we often in our regional economies have been remiss uh, for the education and training for those high demand occupations. So in a perfect world, what would happen is we would use an analysis like this to invest our strong workforce and apprenticeship dollars in these top areas and then hopefully get them off the ground 
And after about three to five years, we would no longer need that investment because now the programs are up and running. And now we can take that investment and we can put it in the secondary and tertiary levels of academic program, right? One of the things we didn't talk about during this because it doesn't pop up because there's not an occupation code is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is essential for all of these occupations because in the 21st century, our students are likely going to be at one point or another independent contractors. So even though, and that's something else that I'm looking, I don't think we're gonna find an apprenticeship I don't know if we would find an apprenticeship opportunity for, for entrepreneurship, but those are characteristics and small certificate programs that we want to ensure that our students are aware of and that they can pop into those classes, right? And same with IT and computer science. We didn't see that pop up, but I call those things management, IT, and computer science. I call them ubiquitous occupational cl clusters. And the reason why you don't see it pop up on fastest growing a lot is because a lot of times those people are now working at a distance. So it's not showing up in your regional economic demands. You're seeing a lot of, um, uh, I guess, inbound workers, workers that are in other county areas fulfilling those jobs in the local area. But that's not to say that it's not an in-demand occupation. So, you know, with everything, to take it with a grain of salt. But this is, for, in my experience, the most effective and meaningful analysis um, methodology that I've developed, that I've seen um, working at community colleges. And this is now my third community college. It's my third time starting a division like this and working on apprenticeships. Um, so it seems to be working. Now, what, we do, what do we do from here, right? So we have our strategic analysis. We looked at our regional economy. The second phase of this is your asset inventory. So your asset inventory is, so what you see right here is a cover of a little booklet I put together summer before last. And what I put in there is, it's a one-stop shop for employers and workers to find education and training resources. There's tons of information in there from your local AJCCs and unemployment offices to your small business development centers and your economic development organizations. I also listed all adult schools in here too and all community colleges. And then what I did is I took all the programming from all three community colleges and all nine of our adult schools and I listed them by industry sector. Um, when I go in to begin an apprenticeship, I create a portfolio of the classes that we have available, non-credit, credit, not for credit, pre-apprenticeships, whatever it is, and I create those portfolios, I bind them, and I create them by industry sector. And I have the employer leaf through that booklet, and I don't just put the, I don't just put the programs of study, I put the course outlines for all of this stuff in there. And I have them dog-ear the pages that they really like. So that's telling me how, what classes we have that correspond to the skill sets that are needed in the occupation that we're building an apprenticeship for. So I call it phase one and phase two. You got to do your analysis and then you got to do your asset inventory because without your asset inventory, you don't know where your gaps are. Um, we're using apprenticeships in Ventura County to fill some gaps, some major, major gaps. Uh, electrical and electronic technician training and industrial machine mechanics that I've already mentioned, those are two that we do not have programming for. But through this analysis and investigation and asset inventory, we were able to identify, oh my goodness, this is huge. What's not showing up in what you just saw today was Naval Base Ventura County in our three commands, and that's where the electrical and electronic technician demand is coming from. But I wouldn't have known that had I not visited the Navy about a dozen times over the past year. So um, it takes a lot of, uh, it's a lot of groundwork, it's a lot of detail, um, but ultimately it lays a really nice foundation for us to build, again, career education and apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, those pre-apprenticeship programs, again, leading into credit bearing programs for both career and college readiness. Um, so that concludes my, my methodology and talk on this. Um, were there any questions from anybody uh, regarding your contextual area? And if not, that's fine. <laughs> okay, good, glad you enjoyed it.
Okay, thank you so yeah. much, Alexandra. This uh, was absolutely super helpful. Um, and I know, you know, one, I made a little note because there was one thing that um, I know we had spoken with, uh, spoken about uh, previously, which was, you know, you were talking about um, using this information as a, as a way to, um, you know, broach the, the conversations with the other stakeholders. You're coming from the, the education perspective. I know not all programs, not all CAI grantees are, uh, are uh, education programs, but rather they're partnered with the community college districts themselves. And uh -huh. so I'm, I'm curious if you have, even though you're coming from an internal perspective, do you find that uh, the community colleges that you work with um, in Ventura are particularly receptive to this kind of information and or does this help open up conversations around how uh, classes or programs partner with uh, 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 community college programs? Sure. So, um, and, and you're correct, those, those third party, those nonprofit partners, right? Right. Um, keeping in mind that we are really a triumvirate. The state chancellor's office wants us to be. It's community colleges, industry, and nonprofits, right? We've heard Von Tonquinlevin talk about that a lot in her stewardship network um, work. And so uh, it's always the 80-20 rule, right? <laughs> um, I'd say 80% of people are really digging this. Uh, counselors, faculty, um, one of the things we do, again, this is analysis so that we can find better funding opportunities and we all need resources. Um, you know, you're always going to have a reluctant 20% that wants to keep doing things the way they're doing, they're do they've been doing them. However, um, the big push and the reason why this methodology I find so useful and it, it is becoming more used is back to the common metrics. Mm -hmm. State of California, um, Perkins monies, uh, you know, strong workforce monies. Our metrics are no longer based on enrollment and completion. It's enrollment, completion, and success after completion. And so a methodology such as this, this is what gives us the success after completion metrics, right? This is how we know our students are going to go get jobs. And so like anything, you know, it takes time. It's incremental. Um, it's humanity, and so we're, we're shifting the way we're making decisions. Um, for those of you involved in strong workforce, um, or even the CHI grants themselves, what were we required to do in order to get the funding? We were required to present labor market information. So again, one of the things that, so right there, it's, it's a requirement in order for us to get funding. Our performance metrics are changing, and again, we're, we're deriving or we're participating in a common metric foundation nowadays. I would caution you this, um, don't just depend on your labor market information to develop your programs. You have to do that inquiry in order to develop the competencies as well as the learning objectives. Um, and that's a really real faculty driven process, but I have found faculty very willing and ready to partner, uh, they don't have all the time in the world, right? So any information that I am able to give to them on their programs of study, they appreciate. Um, so yeah, it's, it's forging new ground. <laughs> um, and, and the more, in fact, I'm actually lecturing for in-service for our three community colleges this Thursday on, on kind of something similar to this. I'm giving them more of a basic kind of Ventura local economy analysis, but um, it's, we have no choice. The train has left the station and we're not going backwards. We're, we're in an era where we're not gonna have the public funding that we used to have. Resources aren't the same and educational platforms have got to change. You know, we're, we're not a, a private institute that can remain closed to this type of analysis. We are being required through our funding mechanisms and through our community service to go ahead and perform this kind of detailed analysis. Great. I know there's a, a couple of other oh, questions yes. that came over the line and we have maybe like one or two minutes. So maybe we can respond to a couple of them. Do you want to just pick out of that group? Yeah, I'll know? just, okay. So you're asking if the a guide's available online. Um, yeah, not yet, but it will be. So the whole point of the guide was that it was a digital format available on the Workforce Development Board side and the Economic Development Collaborative side and my site. Um, and of course, what happened, everybody loves the printed copies. <laughs> so I made it, it's literally the size that you're seeing. It's a tiny little booklet and I print about 500 every few months. 
Um, I just use our internal printing services and I get it to the adult schools and the unemployment offices. But if you can give me just till after the new year, I'll have this online. Um, all you have to do is look up economic and workforce development at Ventura Community College District. So look up vccd.edu, economic and workforce development. I will have it up there probably before Christmas. Um, another question, let's see. I'm not on the workforce board, though I do substitute. I actually just lectured them. We did Workforce 101. So I actually lectured for the Workforce Development Board on, on Ventura Economy so that they can start to understand what their responsibility is in terms of building programs for both youth and adult workers. Um, what are you using for longitudinal data analysis? Um, well, oh, how do you know if your success students are successful over time? So we are implementing, um, at my past institute, I implemented um, a way to track student success after completion. Um, it's a methodology that I worked with IR on. Uh, they coded out a separate database. So basically, to answer your question in a nutshell, we're using job developers. Job developers is a position that we created at all three community colleges using strong workforce funds, regional strong workforce funds, that is. So you need, in my perspective, if you're serving, if your community college is serving over 9,000 students, you need at least two of these people. These people should be placing students, helping them um, find their internships, running internship programs and placing them into full-time jobs, uh, working with them on apprenticeship programs as well. Um, and we, I, like I said, we're using a system where we have a separate database that is coded to speak to Banner so that all the information will be gathered in the same spot. I'm happy to speak with you if you want to follow up via email um, about the, the intricacies of that methodology. Um, the next one, and so that's, it, you know, I've only been here at Ventura for about, gosh, 20 months or so. So we're just starting to do the follow-up. We actually won't be doing follow-up for credit bearing until the spring. That'll be our first round. I also run adult education here at the community college. So we've been doing follow-up for a while and we have 100% placement on that, but that's just of immediate need. And again, that's required by law. We have to have both six months and 12 month follow-up. Um, how do you find the EMSI data reports? You have to go into, um, you have to go into EMSI, economicmodeling.com, and you, it's, there's multiple different reports in there. Again, I've just been using it so long, so I know how to marry information. What you saw today in the PowerPoint is a compilation of several different reports. Um, so if, if, if you'd like more information, I think if that might be John Milborn over at COC. I'm happy to chat with you and show you where I found it. Um, if not, you can reach me via email, and again, I'm happy to, to help out with that. So I hope this was helpful for everybody and informative. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much. And all, we also, um, as we do with all webinars, we've recorded it as well. Um, and we'll um, make the slides available as well so people can go back. Um, oh, and John was asking about funding for EMSI. Oh, how do you fund? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I pay for, I'm fee-based, so I pay for my own EMSI. Um, community colleges are paying for it out of strong workforce. I'd say the majority of community colleges across the state of California are using strong workforce to pay for their EMSI database. Right now, um, EMSI is running about 14.5 a year for, well, it's for the package we have, which I said um, has the job analytics inside of it too. But I just spoke with them. I've known them for many years. And like I said, their all centers of excellences are required to use it. And then furthermore, they said all community colleges in the state of, of California are using their strong workforce funds right now. In other areas, um, I've seen Perkins funds used because again, it's, it's a requirement for the, the development of credit bearing and non-credit programming now. So using Perkins funds or strong workforce is perfectly reasonable. Great. Great. And so, like I was saying, we've, uh, we're going to have the recording up so people can access it and folks who miss this can access it as well. And we'll also post the webinars. Thank you so much, Alexandra. This was a fantastic presentation, quite informative. And, um, and best to everybody. All right. We hope you have a good welcome. rest of the week and a good holiday time. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Hope everybody has a good holiday season. Okay. Take care, everybody.